want to address the real reason for Thanksgiving. You know, I know it's time of year. A lot of people are already getting into Christmas, but uh, I think really a, a, a more biblical uh, reason, a more biblical season would be the season of Thanksgiving than that of even Christmas. We don't know when Christ was born, but for Thanksgiving, it's always a season to give thanks. Paul said, I thank God upon every remembrance of you to the Philippians, there in Philippians 1 and verse uh, 3, and it is always uh, good to give thanks. But one thing that we do in our society is oftentimes we participate in things that we really don't know where it started or really the, the background of it. Don't have a great appreciation for what things really uh, uh, happened before time comes to us to do this. In other words, Thanksgiving comes along, we celebrate every year, we have a turkey and whatever else that, that's laid out there on the table, and we really seldom forget the whole thing, the basis behind the first Thanksgiving. And what I want to do tonight, friends, is just give you some history about the first Thanksgiving and just show that it had to do with individuals coming together and actually putting in place the principles that God said to follow all along, and that is really what caused them to be in a position to give thanks. It is the idea of doing what God said, realizing that His wisdom is far above man's wisdom, and that was why they were actually able to come and together and say, thank you, give a thanksgiving to God. What? They didn't thank the Indians for teaching them how to raise corn. The, these people knew how to, how to farm before they got there. But they gave thanks to God for the bountiful crops and all the blessings that had been stored upon them. But it took them two years to realize that, you know what, we've actually neglected biblical principles that we should have been following all along. So here's the lesson, lesson behind the first real Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving... Uh, is a result of the uh, pilgrims, if you will, over in the, uh, in the Plymouth Colony in 1621. The, uh, William Bradford was the governor. And uh, when they first came over and landed at Plymouth Rock and so forth and set up camp, set up a colony, they organized the colony as dictated by their uh, uh, business associates way back over the, the ocean. And they started people working, and everybody was, was working together. They were working the land, raising crops, and everything that was produced went into a community store. It was, a, it was really communism. It was really a, a thing that everybody had everything in common, and everybody uh, shared the work. But it wasn't so much of a work sharing as it was individuals realized that I can lack, slack off and let someone else do my work. That's what caused the problem. And in, by 1623, there was so much starvation because the crops weren't being produced, people weren't working to try to get ahead and prepare for the winters, that it was going to be very hard for them to survive. And many people died in the first two years because they didn't put in place biblical principles. So what Governor Bradford did was he realized that, you know what? Communism does not produce productivity. Communism, everybody having uh, things in a, on, a, on a communal basis, actually you're going to see that the wives of some men had to do work for the young unmarried men, and that wasn't going over well. So communism, everybody doing everything on a equal level and having to share everything was actually encouraging and rewarding waste and actually promoted laziness and inefficiency and it destroyed individual initiative. In other words, when everybody looks about and says, you know what, I can slack off a little bit, I can slack off a little bit and Mark, Mark will do more of the work and I'll still get what he gets. Why should I work hard? Think about it this way. You go to a restaurant, and I, I think this is the way restaurants work today. I, I don't know for sure. But I believe, 
someone that, 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 that knows can call in and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that waitresses and waiters, when they get a tip, they have to put it all in the community pot and they divide it up amongst everybody. I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like that. I would work hard for my tip. I would work hard for the bonus that someone gave me for giving them good service. I wouldn't want to share it. But what Governor Bradford realized was when you tell everybody, well, you're going to get the benefit from someone else's labor, the people who aren't working, they'll work even less. And the people who are working, they're going to say, wait, wait, why should I work and let this slacker over here get the benefit of it? I'm not going to work either. And so all it, they, all it did was promote hard feelings. It promoted laziness. It, it took away the initiative of individuals to work and produce. Now, what they did put in place then was they put in place biblical principles. Here's what Governor Bradford wrote from his own journal. He said, The experience that was had in this common course and condition tried sundry years and that amongst godly and sober men may well invince the vanity of that conceit of Plato and other ancients applauded by some of later times. In other words, people are saying, oh, this is the great way, this is the way to go, this is the way to go. And he says, you know what? When you actually put it into practice, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And he said that the taking away of property and bringing in community into a commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing as if they were wiser than God. In other words, they thought by putting everything together, everybody having a, a, a community, in other words, you're sharing in what other people do, you get, a, you get a, a piece of what everybody else is working for, you don't have to work, but yet you're still getting the benefit of it. He said what that does is that does not make people happy. It may, you may think it makes them happy because everybody will be the same. We'll all be on the same level and everybody will be equal. He said, that doesn't make them happy. And he said, as if you're wiser than God. That's not going to happen. Now, we see some of that in, in our, our society today. People say, well, we need, we, need, uh, all of, we need everybody to have the same thing because the rich people have a lot and the poor people have nothing. Well, don't bring the rich people down because all you're doing is you're bringing them down, but you're not bringing anybody up. And it will make those people who are working hard make them less productive because they don't want to share by force what they've been working hard for when someone else is not working for. Now listen, Governor Bradford realized this. He says, for this, community was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. He said all it did was make people discontent, angry at one another. And he says this, For the young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine, that is, they, they, the, that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any recompense. In other words, they're working hard. They're working hard for it. And... Not only are you providing for yourself, but actually you're providing for this man over here and this man's wife and this man's children. And they said, hey, wait a minute. We ought to be getting more because we're, we're working harder for it. But yet we're having to su supply all, support all these little guys' families. And he says, the strong had no more in division of victuals and clothes than he that was weak. In other words, the strongest one was eating the same amount of food and had the exact same clothes as those who were weak and not able to do a quarter of the other that the other could. This was thought injustice. It was injustice. It was injustice. Now, the aged and the graver men, to be ranked and equalized in labors and everything else, thought it some indignity and disrespect to them. In other words... You are in a position of you're doing all the greater good and you're doing the harder labor, but yet you're being treated like someone who can't do half or a quarter of what you're doing. And so it gives a sense of injustice and it does not promote a good work ethic. It does not promote good work habit. It actually encourages slothfulness and laziness and it just wasn't working. And so they had to change. They had to change. They had to change. Uh, Bradford goes on to write. 
He said, for men's wives to be commanded to do service for other men as dressing their meat, washing their clothes, etc., they deemed it kind of slavery. Well, rightly so. I wouldn't want someone coming up and telling my wife she had to fix food for some other man or wash somebody else's clothes. See? All of these are Bible principles that are already in place that are being violated here. The Bible says, let a woman be subject to her own husband. Not everybody else. And the Bible says, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Second Thessalonians 3.10. See, all of these things are Bible principles and they're being thrown out the door. So it says, neither could many husbands well brook to it. In other words, many husbands didn't like it either. I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't like it if someone came up and told me, well, your wife has to do such and such for me. I don't think so. I don't think so. Upon the point, all being to have a like and all to do a like, they thought themselves in the like condition and one as good as another. And so, if it did not cut off those relations that God had set amongst men, all right, in other words, if it didn't just totally make them enemies, yet it did at least much diminish and take off the mutual respects that should be preserved amongst them, God in His wisdom saw another course fitter for them. In other words, God's principles, God's principles were wiser than man's, but yet when you put everybody in the same pot and say you're going to get the exact same amount of food, you're going to wear the exact same amount of clothes, and you're going to get the exact same amount of pay, even though you may be doing more, working more, working harder, more efficient, uh, so forth, you're still going to get the same thing everybody else is doing who are below you. He says all that does is breed cons- uh, a resentment. It does not make for a good community. It doesn't make good for a good society. And so they realized the problem. So here's what they did. They divided the property up. They divided the property up by lot, and they said, here's what happens. Each family gets a piece of land for their own. And they divided up seed like corn and divided up and they said now you are going to work and you're going to provide for your own family and if your family starves it's on you it's on you you've got to work for it no one else is going to come and be forced to care for you see so you had to work for your own well they did and you know what happened they started producing more food they had an abundance of crops because people were working hard and, and had some uh, 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 self uh, 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 self pride, I guess you might say, about the kind of work they were doing. They took some, uh, they had integrity and they had dignity and they had some sort of resolve that I'm going to make a, 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 a make a go of this. And so what they did was they had bumper crops. They produced more. People were working harder, and anything that they had left over, they could trade for their neighbors. Maybe their neighbors had had uh, 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 animals that they wanted. So they could trade meat for some kind of crop or some kind of produce for, for bread or whatever. They could barter. And so it was very productive. And so instead of sloth, laziness, and envy, and resentment, and anger among the colonists, what they had was they had hard work. They had people uh, being uh, uh, productive. And people were happy with each other. Now, friends... These are all principles that God has said all along and put in place. You see, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 and verse 28 that that a man should work, laboring with his hands that which is good, that he might have to give. Now, if someone wanted to come along and give to someone who who, uh, uh, had need, if someone wanted to come along and uh, give to someone who maybe didn't have so much, that was their business. But it was the idea of being forced or being told, you have to do this, you have to give such and such to this other man or this other family. That was what caused resentment. You see, uh, the Bible knows, or God knew, and thus he put in the Bible, that a man that is allowed to do things of his own will and of his own volition will be more productive and more willing to dispense of what he has if he's given the freedom to do it, the freedom to choose. And so, again, Bible principles 
had been neglected, and that is what was causing all the resentment. But when they actually put Bible principles in place, they actually had harmony, they had peace, and they had productivity, and thus they were in a better uh, uh, setting. The whole colony benefited from it. Here's what Bradford said. He said they had very good success, for it made all hands very industrious. So as much where corn was planted than otherwise would have been. More corn was planted. Why? Because it's something you, you get to benefit from it. You get to succeed at it. No one's stopping you. No one's stifling you. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set corn, which before would allege weakness and inability. Oh, these little, they're the list little children. They can't go. They can't do it. And so they would sit around at home. See, but oh, but well, your your survival depends upon it. Hey, let's go. Let's all pitch in. Family effort, and it was successful. And it said, "Whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression." All right, if you made them do it, oh no, you're you're making me do something. You're oppressing me. But if you give them the freedom and the uh, the the opportunity. To succeed at something, they will do it in a great way. He says, by this time harvest come, by this time harvest uh, was come, and instead of famine, now, watch it, now God gave them plenty, and uh, God gave them plenty, and the faces of things were changed to the rejoicing of the hearts of many, for which they blessed God. You see what would just happen, friends? They started neglecting Bible principles and it caused resentment, laziness, slothfulness, envy, strife, all kinds of stuff that led to starvation. Many people died. But when they put Bible principles in place and said, let a man work, labor with his hands, that which is good. And if a man provide not for his own, he's worse uh, than an infidel. See, so when you put this in, when you uh, put this in, in place, I just missed. I just missed that. What's uh, First Timothy five and verse eight? If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he denied the faith and is worse than the infidel. Bible principles dictate that a man provides for his own family, not expect someone else to provide for them. You see, and what that does, that causes productivity when you put the responsibility squarely on the back of the person on whom it belongs. Now, let me just say this. We get away from Bible principles all the time in this country. We actually we actually set up a society where people benefit from the hard work of others when they are able-bodied now listen carefully. When they're able-bodied to get out and do their own work but yet they want to say, well, I'm going to let somebody else do it. I'm going to let somebody else work, and I'm just going to draw a check. Or someone says, well, you know what? My, my children can't go to work. You know, my, my sons don't go to work. But they're going to sit at home, and they're going to play video games, and they're going to watch TV, and they're going to drink soda pop and eat popcorn sit on the couch, and they're 20 years old. I actually had a man tell me one time, I, I think it was his sister, I'm not sure, but said, uh, uh, she said, well, I expect, his sister said, well, I expect, I expect a man could be able to do X, Y, and Z around the house. And he said, well, you got two full-grown boys that are living in the house with you. Oh, but these are my babies. Well, you know what? The Bible says, the Bible says that if a man doesn't work, you know what? He shouldn't eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. And that's the exact same principle that Governor Bradford finally put in place in realizing that we are doing society harm because we're not using God's principle. People are not productive when you when you neglect God's principles. And so, when they put God's principles in place, they started thanking God because they recognized that God's wisdom was wiser than man. And here's the result. The bounty was so great. Bumper crops. Bumper crops so great that they had enough not only to trade among themselves, but also... With the Indians, the neighboring Indians. And in 1623, they had a great feast to which they also invited all the Indians. 
And the, and the Indians, I think it was about 90 Indians, uh, came into this great feast, and they, watch this, they provided venison. They provided uh, part of the feast. Isn't that the hospitable thing to do? Certainly it is. Certainly it is. They brought some of the food, but thanks was given to God for bringing the bountiful crop. And the reason why the bountiful crop existed was because they started following God's principles, and thus it was a day of Thanksgiving. So my point in bringing up the Thanksgiving story is to show that when you put Bible principles in place, you'll have abundance. You'll have abundance because Bible principles work. Bible principles allow people to be productive and be successful and will cause them to succeed at what they're accomplishing and then have a joyful uh, countenance and a joyful attitude that will cause them to actually want to help someone else. And say, hey, let's, let's all get together. Let's pitch in. Now, here's why I'm saying that. When people follow Bible principles, they work hard, they produce much. But when man's wisdom kicks in, it takes away all the incentive. It takes away all the desire. It takes away all of the, the effort. And people go, you know what? I just ain't going to do it. I just don't want to do it. And so really what it becomes is more like instead of thanksgiving, it's thanks-taking. And here's why I call it thanks-taking. Churches of men have this idea that if they tell people what to give and how much to give, and they put a burden on the people, that they're going to be blessed. But you know what I find this, this uh, day and age, especially around this time of year? Instead of making it possible for people to give thanks, men put burden on other individuals by neglecting God's principles and actually cause people to lose the desire, to lose the cheerfulness, and it takes away what God intended to be in the hearts of men. Now, you know what? When you walk outside uh, Walmart or the mall, and I don't know if they're set up. I think they're set up already, aren't they? The, the Salvation Army? The, the, the ding-a-lings are already out. And they're out there ringing the bell, and they're asking people for money. Now, that's the Salvation Army Church. The Salvation Army Church begs people for money. They begs people for money. Now, you, they've gotten away from Bible principles. The Bible clearly states how people are supposed to give. If this was indeed a, a scriptural church, they would be taking in money and providing for the, uh, uh, providing for the, uh, the cost of all their ministries in the way the Bible says. But they don't. They actually put the red pot out there and beg people. They want people to donate their change. They want people to donate their cars. They want people to donate this and that, X, Y, and Z to them so that they can fund their ministry. Well, they get away from Bible principles. People are begging. See? It's not thanksgiving, it's thanks taking. They're taking away the, the thanks. Here's another example. Here's a, this is from the Jamestown, uh, uh, ironically enough, Jamestown Methodist Church, right down the road here toward Greensboro. And look what they're asking. They're asking people to go to the next level in stewardship. Your stewardship commitment card. Tell us how much money you are going to send us, and just in case you need help, we're going to give you a chart. And here's what you need to be giving. If you are currently giving a dollar, you need to give a dollar and ten cents. If you're currently giving a hundred dollars, you need to give a hundred and ten dollars. See? You, you, here's your guideline of what you need to give. And then, if that's not enough, if that's not enough, here is your income and the, on, on the left-hand column here. And I say, well, you may be giving two percent, but you need to get on up to 3% for the foundation. Eventually, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then a tithe. You need to get on up here. Increase your giving. Increase your giving. 
if you are giving, if you are making four hundred dollars, if you're making four hundred dollars a week, a month, a day, whatever, you need to be giving ten percent. All right. Now think about this, friends. What if someone's making four hundred dollars a month? There's some people out there who are living on four or five hundred dollars a month. You mean to tell me that it's going to be easy for this person to give cheerfully when they're told they've got to give a tenth of this? They've got to give a tithe of this? But you see how oppressive men can be? The church of men are oppressing people. They're to get away from Bible principles. And the reason why they're worried about money and why they're always begging for money is because guess what? They're getting away from Bible principles. They're not doing what God said do. They're not uh, teaching people to give as God said give. And so, we're seeing the same effects that they had uh, up there in, 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 the, in the colonies. You're seeing the same things. They're doing what? Well, they're being lazy. They're not going to give. I don't want to do something that I'm forced to do. That's oppression. That's tyranny. Don't make me do it. You tell me I have to do it, I'm going to rebel against you. See? But people always beg for money. They always beg for money because they uh, because they uh, they think, you know, they think, well, I'm not going to get anything if I, I'm not going to get any money unless I do beg, unless I do insist or tell people that, they're, that they uh, have to give uh, 10%. Now, Here's one I want you to really pay attention to, this next one. Because this is a classic example. This is a classic example of what of what we're talking about. In Eden, in Eden, there is a there is a church that you probably have heard of. It's the Osborne Baptist Church. And the senior pastor, Steve Griffith, wants you to fund his vision. I want to play. Uh, I want to play a little message from from uh, Mr. Griffith. I think I'm saying his name right. And I want you to I want you to listen to it, watch it, listen to it, and uh, tell me what you think. Or just not necessarily tell me what you think, but I just want you to listen to it and uh, listen to his uh, to his message. I want you to get up here where we can get up where we can make sure we get him all on here. Okay. And he's going to tell you about why he's wanting you, why he's wanting you to. Hey, welcome to our website. I appreciate you logging on to hear this important message. You, you know what? God is doing great things at our church. You know why? Because of you. All of us individuals together make up the church. And when you exercise faith and seek God and all those things that matter in life, and we all come together exercising those things individually, we become the church. It is a powerful thing in the hand of God. Um, boy, God is... <clears throat> just doing great things here, and I just appreciate <coughs> so much you being a part of this church. Now, you know what? When God starts doing great things, it often creates a challenge. I need to talk to you about a challenge. You, you know, Pretty two years ago... We uh, built a children's facility. It cost about $2.4 million to build. We still owe about a million dollars. Whoa, Here whoa, whoa. Stop right there. Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. We started building something, and we need you to give. You know what? Let's, let's go ahead and talk about get away from Bible principles here. Did, uh, did, did I not read somewhere in the Bible about this principle? In Luke 14, in about verse 26, uh, verse 28, which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Now, I understand, I understand that, you know, it is, uh, it, it, there's nothing wrong with borrowing money and being able to pay it out. If you've got the income and everything, you know you can pay it out, buying on time, not necessarily uh, wrong with that. But he just said, we started building on something, and we still got to finish it. Now, I'm kind of worried about that. 
But we're starting to violate Bible principles the challenge. Here. We're already out of space. We're out of children's space. We're out of teenager space. We're out of worship space. Now, what are we going to do? Well, we want to do only what Jesus wants us to do. But he's this is beg his for money, church, contrary and to what he Jesus will said. guide us exactly where he wants us to be. So we're just on our knees praying, God, where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? Do you want us to build? Do you want us to add service? What do you want us to do? And we're just waiting on God. The Bible says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Psalm 27 says, wait therefore on the Lord. So we're going to do that. And, and as soon as God makes it clear to us what he wants us to do, then, then we're, man, we're moving boldly, full steam ahead with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, wait a minute. We're moving boldly, full steam ahead, but we're waiting on the Lord to tell us what to do? We don't, so that, that tells me like we're boldly going straight ahead and have no clue where we're going. Number one. But number two, we don't know what the Lord wants us to do, but until then, we've got a million dollars that I'm going to hit you up for. Now, friends, I'm just, I'm trying to just, I'm trying to show you what happens when you get away from Bible principles. This is thanks taking. This is thanks, it's not thanksgiving. This is thanks taking. So, you know, just keep this in mind when, when we're talking about what, the, what these people are asking of you. All right? But between now and then, uh, we still owe about a million dollars on our building. And, and those giving pledges from the Generation to Generation campaign are up this month. So here's what we need you to do. We need 500 people to give $50 a month to the Generation to Generation Building Fund so that we can continue to pay off our debt until God makes it very clear to us what He wants us to do. And then we'll have a, a, a real broad campaign at that time to let you know where we're going and what we're going to build Keep or if we're going to build. The Lord talk to us. But between now and then, here's what I need you to do. We have these boards here in the worship center. These boards uh, have 500 cards that look like this on them. On the back of the card, it says, I commit to giving $50 per month for 10 months to the Generation Generation Building Fund. Now, if 500 people will commit $50 a month for 10 months, it, it'll more than cover our ability to, to continue to reduce our debt between now and the time we have a bigger plan. So I'm asking you, Will you commit $50 a month to the Generation to Generation Building Fund for 10 months? 10 months, because you say, we don't know where we're going, but we've got an awful lot of debt. We need you to keep on giving. Now, listen. Listen, friends, I want to stop right there, and I, just, I, I want you to consider this. I want you to consider this. When somebody asks you to keep sending them money, and they don't know where they're going, in other words, they don't know where the Lord wants them to go, then you need to be careful. You need to be aware. I actually have, if I, if I could pull it up, I actually have a video clip of Benny Hinn saying the same thing. He was, going to ra he was raising money for a healing center, of all things, raising money for a, a healing center, people sending all the money, and then started asking, when's it going to be built? And he said, well, the Lord told me to wait. Oh, that's convenient. That's convenient. See? But we're already getting away from Bible principles. If, if the Osborne Baptist Church was acting on Bible principles, you wouldn't have to say, well, let, let's build this and build that, and we'll beg for money. We'll beg for money. I want you to think about this, friends. Let's just put it in perspective. This was in the Osborne Baptist Church Bulletin this past Sunday. All right? This was in the Osborne Baptist Church Bulletin this past Sunday. And I want you to notice what their weekly budget is. Not annual, not monthly, but weekly budget. $24,000. Now, there's a reason why I call this thanks taking. I want you to put I want to put this in perspective. You see, in the eyes of men, it is the Lord's ministry to build tree houses and Starbucks esque cafes 
where you can get your hot dogs and your coffee and go into worship and have a good old time. But that's not God's wisdom. When you start doing that, you need this. You need this kind of a budget to operate that. But let's put this in perspective. $24,000 a week. Let's look right there in Eden. Did you know that half of the city of Eden, the people that live in Eden, half of them have an annual an annual income of less than $30,000 a year? And the Osborne Baptist Church needs to build a bigger building and they have a weekly budget of $24,000. So their weekly budget is almost what some people, half the people in Eden make in a year. Is it Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving? Are they following God's principles? No. Not following God's principles. Number one, if they were following God's principles, they wouldn't have a ministry that required 22 or 20 foot tree houses. And they wouldn't have a cafe, Starbucks coffee cafe. They wouldn't need that. Because the ministries that you find in the Bible are based upon purely teaching God's Word. No gimmicks, no gadgets, you know, no playgrounds. No party rooms. It's just preaching the word. But yet now, church of, uh, church of Man has come up, and here they are, asking people to give money to a project when half the people in the city don't make what they're taking in in a, in a week. They don't make that in a year. Now stop and think about this, friends. Let's put it in a little more perspective. The average income in the United States of America, that's averaging in all Bill Gates and everybody else, averaging all their salaries. The average income in the United States of America is $45,000 a year. In two weeks, the Oswald Baptist Church takes that in. Now, I'm just saying, are we really following God's principles? And does it promote individuals who want to give you see, this is what they say. In order to convince people that this is what God wants you to do, they come up with this idea. Funding the vision. And they insist that you give your tithes. Now here, this is again from the bulletin, this past week, this past Sunday. Malachi 3, 6-10 through 10 is quoted. Because they want you to give your tithes and your offerings in order to fund the vision that didn't come from God, came right from the mind of man. The argument is, well, look, tithing has always been God's standard of giving. Friends, that's a lie. That's a bald-faced lie. Tithing has not always been God's standard of giving, and even if it had been, now that a new system, a new testament is in place, it's not anymore. Just because Abraham paid a tithe in Genesis chapter 14 doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that that's what God has always commanded. And just because Malachi says bring your tithes and offering does not mean that's what God commanded. But see, here's the, here's the argument. Jesus, Jesus affirmed tithing. I'm sorry that you can't read that, but he has quoted there in Matthew 23. Matthew 23 and verse 23. But let's answer some of this. Look, tithing was not designed to be forever. Mr. Griffith said, well, tithing has always been God's standard. Well, let's just see. Even if it was, it never was intended to be forever. It changed, at least when the priesthood changed. Hebrews 7 verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made necessity to change also the law. 
For he of whom these things are spoken pertained to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Nobody from the tribe of Judah ever went up to the altar. No tribe from Judah was ever, nobody from the tribe of Judah was ever a priest. And therefore, no one from the tribe of Judah would ever receive tithes. How do we know? Because the tithes were, uh, were commanded to be taken of, uh, of the Hebrews, excuse me, the priests were commanded to take the tithes, the Levites. Hebrews 7, and verse 5. Notice this. And verily, they that are the sons of Aaron, or sons of Levi, who received the office of priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Now, I don't think Steve Griffith is a Levi. I'm quite sure he's not. He doesn't have a command to tell people to tithe. And then they had to take it of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. If you're going to take any tithes, you need to take it out of the Jews. Take it from the Jews. Last time I checked, we give them more money than they give us. See? Not following Bible principles. Not following biblical principles. Now, if the priesthood that received the tithes changed, why would tithing remain? If the priesthood that received the tithes, if it changed, why then would you remain or keep in place the tithing? That was to go to people that now are out of a job. But the argument is made, well, but Jesus said you ought to tithe. Jesus said you ought to tithe. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said you ought to tithe. Did he really? He said to the, to the Pharisees, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Now listen. He told them they ought to tithe because they were still living in a time when the old system was still in place. They ought to have tithed because that was what the law required under which they were living. If we are living under the New Testament, then we ought to give as the New Testament orders. How about that? I know it's a novel idea, kind of strange, to, to actually be going to the New Testament to get authority for why we're doing what we're doing when we claim to live under the New Testament. But nonetheless, let's try and see if it works. You see, people would not be begging for money. They wouldn't have to beg for money from their members and say, oh, please give this, please give that. We're a million dollars in the hole. We need to buy, we need to build a new gym. We need to build whatever. If they would simply buy, follow uh, biblical principles. Look at this. Tithing is not the way that God designed giving in the New Testament. It gets back to the very principle that Governor Bradford learned the hard way, by the way, back in the 1600s. If you put Bible principles in place, it makes people more productive. Here's why. Just as Governor Bradford determined that if I put Bible principles in place, people will be more productive because they're not being oppressed, they're not being told that they have to do this, then so it will be the case that people will be more willing to give of what they have earned from their own, from their own hard labors. The Bible says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. Now watch this. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Do you see this? God loves a cheerful giver. The reason why God knows that people will be cheerful when they give this way is because they're not being told they must give it. It won't be a, a, a tyrannical command. It won't be an oppressive command. It won't be something that is dictated upon them that they must do it. And thus they will not give as freely 
and as cheerfully and as willingly as they will if they're given the free will to choose and to do as they please or as they uh, as they desire. See what happens when you get away from Bible principles? Bible principles will actually allow you to do more for the Lord if you will just teach the people and let them have the liberty that God says they can have. I find it very interesting that people take liberties with everything that God has said. They do more than what God requires except when it comes to giving. When it comes to the one place that God definitely has said, let people choose to give as much as they want to, give as they prospered and as they purposed, people dictate, oh no, no, you don't have the liberty to do that. You have to tithe. You must tithe. And then, above that, give your offerings. It's not in the Scripture. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the New Testament. Even if it was a principle that has been from the beginning of time up to the cross, it ended at the cross because Christ put a new law in place. And thus, the commands that we have now on giving actually say, actually, actually dictate that it is a free will offering, a free will giving, and tithing is not commanded. You see? But it gets down to following the Bible principles. And so, what we're learning, not following God's plan makes people not want to give. Makes people not want to give. God loved the cheerful giver. Don't, 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 don't oppress them with, with uh, man-made uh, dictates. Every man according as he purposes in his heart. You tell him he has to give 10%. You must tithe. You just, you just told, told him how much he can purpose. You just made him give grudgingly. You just made him give out of necessity. And more than likely, he's not going to be very happy about it. You know what? I hear people all the time say, man, all they do is talk about money. All they do is talk about giving. All they do is want my money. Got to build a bigger building. They got to fund this and fund that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we got to have a spaghetti supper in order to pay for the the youth the the youth uh, uh, camping trip or something. Yeah, we've got to have a raffle. Yeah, we've got to have a car wash in order to raise money. We're going to have yoga classes to go to the building fund. That's what to do in the Presbyterian church. See? Why not just why not just give the way God said? Let every man lay by in store. And give as he purposed and as he prospered. See? But what we have is we have people who are under a burden. When you when you uh, get away from God's principles, you put a burden on people. You put a burden on people. You're asking them to pay for something that God never even said you should have in the first place. See? Where do you get the authority to have the playgrounds and the cafes and the, you know, the disco balls and the, uh, in the auditorium? Where do you get the authority for that? See, you're putting a burden on people wanting them to provide for something that if you're following God's principles in other areas, you wouldn't even have to provide to, play, to pay for. And then, when you don't follow God's principles, then you actually, you actually uh, make it to where other people benefit from the labors of others. Do the pastors tithe the tithe that they receive? You ever time think about that? The one who's benefiting from all the tithes, the one who benefits the most from all the tithes, is the one who's telling you you have to do it. You're out there working hard. You're out there working hard for your money, and the preachers up there going, yeah, now you need to give me the money. You need to send me the money. That, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about. Is that a burden? Is that a, is that a worry? You know, are the are the are the pastors uh, priests where they should get the tithes, and then they insist you give them, and then admit? But you know what? Really, what we're using them for is not even what the Bible says. Listen to what this guy says. 
Mr. Otis, uh, somebody, he's down in Greensboro. This is what he says. If this church was a 100% tithing church, we would pay off every building project we would ever engage. And if we gave offerings, Ties were not designed for building. If this church was a hundred percent tithing church, we would pay off every building project we would ever engage. Ties were not designed for building. Are you hearing? Me? If this church was a hundred percent tithing church. We would pay off every building project we would ever engage and tithes were not designed for building. All right, he's saying, if this church was a hundred percent tithing church, we'd pay off every building project. And then he turned around and said, tithing is not to build buildings. Now, wait a minute. Which is it? Are you going to use tithing to tithes to pay off the building project or are you not going to use tithes to, to, to build a building? Which is it? But see, when, when these guys step outside the boundaries and start doing what God uh, does not command or what does not authorize, then, then you start having uh, 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 people pay for things and do things that God never even said they should do to start with. That's what we're talking about. See? It all gets down to using Bible principles. Using the Bible principles that God put in place and following them. When it comes to giving, you don't have to beg, you won't have to beg for money. If you'll present, if you'll present a vision that's from God's Word and says this is the work of the church, what the work of the church needs to be, and put it out there, the people will give cheerfully and willingly to the project. Look, in Acts chapter eleven, whoop, sorry about that. In, in Acts, chapter 11, verse 29, the, or 28, the disciples learned that there was going to be a need. In other words, there was going to be a famine. And they were going to need to send relief to people in another part of the country. There stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. They gave to this work. When they saw the need, they gave every man according to his ability. Just like Paul said, 1 Corinthians 16, they laid down towards men prospered. They gave as they purposed. Then they determined to send it, and they did. They met the cause. No gadgets, no gimmicks. Just simply doing what God said. Listen, friends, we're trying to show you. Bible principles give people a reason to give. Following Bible principles give people a way to give cheerfully and willingly. And if men, if men would simply do what God said and present that to people then the people would gladly give and they would support that. All right, let's uh, go ahead and have the phone numbers up. Sorry about that. Uh, do we have a call to take? You on the word from the Lord? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I was talking with a lady the other day who, was, uh, who attends the Osborne Baptist Church, and it was told to her, uh, you know, she, she just got married about a year ago, and her and her husband are in a little bit of difficulties, and... Uh, Basically, she, she was, you know, needing money to take and, and uh, pay her light bill, and they told her, you know, well, you need to pay your tithes first, you know, and God will provide that. So that's just, you know, it just kind of gets me that, that, you know, they're telling her, well, go on, pay your tithes, pay your tithes, and stuff like this, and not worry about a light bill. Right. I think even in the, in, in this sermon, uh, which... I could actually, if I, if I knew exactly where it was, that Steve Griffith actually made reference to the fact of pay your Duke bill first. Which I'm not saying, you know, which I would never say to someone, you know, let's put God last on the list of giving. But 
when, when it comes from people who are already abusing the giving system, they're not teaching people the truth on that, I find it very interesting that you know they would insist, well, go ahead and give your tithes first, and then we'll help you. Did they help her with the light bill? I, I don't know. She, she didn't say. She didn't say. Well, surely you you would hope. I would hope. I'm, I'm gonna give them benefit of the doubt. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, surely they'll, I hope that they would have at least gone ahead and. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to encourage someone about giving and then help them, uh, rather than tell them you need to give. But and since you haven't, I'm not going to help you. Uh, but but still, it gets back to people will will more willingly do what they're supposed to do if you're following Bible principles. So that, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. I wonder how many other people uh, are giving to this cause um, but yet are suffering because they're, t- they're being uh, put upon to give in a way that's contrary to what God has always said. All right, well, thanks for your call. All right, thanks, sir. You want to work the Lord? You want to work the Lord? Welcome to the program. Hey, James, this is Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Uh, I was watching a... Uh, James, you there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was uh, uh, watching the uh, that TCT network. Uh-huh. And that's where uh, John Hagee does a lot of his uh, television comes on. Right. And he was talking about the, uh, if you didn't give a tenth, the... the still there? Yeah, I'm still here. We're kind okay. of echoing back and forth. Okay. And uh, he, he said that God ought to chop off, chop off your hands. Really? If if you don't if you don't give if you don't pay your tithes, God will chop off your hand. That's that's what John Hague was saying, and uh, I was just looking at his uh, the, the people that come into his church. I can imagine the money he gets from people giving a tenth in that church. But yeah, he, that was his actual words that God should chop off your hands. Right. Hmm. Well, the TCT crowd. Uh, I, uh, I I'm looking here at my. At my list, there, uh, you know, that's how they operate. Is how is, is getting people to give. Let me see if I can play this. Uh, let me play this video clip from the TCT crowd. Okay. Wants to know from Indiana concerning tithe. I can't go to church right now due to a physical problem, but I do give to several Christian ministries or on TV. Is that acceptable to God? She's not going to church yes. because of physical... Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Surely I want to also declare to you, even though you're not going to church, if you're still connected, you got to understand, that's home. That's your home that's church. Really that's true. still where you're going to call on people and they're going to cover you and protect you. Yeah. And yet we want to encourage you about all the other ministries as well, as much as you can do. You know, one great thing about TCT is it doesn't take away, come to take away from the local church. They believe yeah. in the local church. Yeah. And we appreciate you being a part of TCT, being a part of Ask the Pastor. Today. We got so many questions that we couldn't get to, but we want to encourage you to keep calling, keep watching, okay, because you never so know which program you're watching that you. So there you go. If you're, you know, if you're not able to get it home, well, send your tie to the TV program because, because that'll get you covered. You know, uh, anything to make a buck. That's what we're in for. So, uh, oppressing the people. Well, thanks for your call. Thank, thank you, James. Huh. You're in the word from the Lord. Yes. How you doing, uh, Brother James? I'm doing well. Well, that's good. Listen, I, I am really, really impressed tonight with your sermon. Uh, really got good meaning to it. Uh, and thank you so much for unveiling the the uh, the way people try to bring money into their pockets. But listen, I got one question that you brought up on the screen. I'm not sure. It wasn't in a verse, but it was in something that, about your tithing. It says mint, anes, and coming. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what those words meant. I was wondering if you could input those are, that. Those are, tell those, me what that means. All right. Those are spices. Spices. Yeah, yeah. But what has that got to do with the tithing? Though? Well, what they asking, they were I supposed guess. to tithe all their crops and whatever. And Jesus said, you know, these Pharisees they went down to the they went down to the the the, the smallest thing they could. They tithed that. I mean, can you imagine going in and tithing your spice rack? 
Yeah. You know, giving a ten percent of all your cinnamon and whatever. Yeah. But and so they were very particular about tithe, giving a tenth of the little things. But they were neglecting the weightier matters of the law. You know, they weren't they weren't concerned about justice and mercy, and you know, faith and so forth. They weren't worried about that. But they would make sure they gave a tenth of the, even the smallest, uh, you know, smallest thing of their in, in their homes or whatever. So the 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 tie, the mint and the, the cumin and the anise, these were all spices and things like that. That's what they were concerned about. Okay. Jesus, Jesus was saying in another place, you're you're uh, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. You know, they're actually the little things they're real particular about, but the big things they're not really concerned about. So it, it'd be kind of like if you're washing your car. You know, you 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 polish your you polish your hubcaps, but you don't wash the rest of your car. You know that. What, what's the point? Or you you polish your hubcaps, but you don't change the oil in your car. That makes sense. Yeah. So, take care of the, all of it, and it's what Jesus will say. Well, uh, about the Thanksgiving, uh, what I what I this is like. You know, when I when I listen to you, I listen to you quite often because I think you really uh, bring a point home to what it's all about. I mean, I'm really impressed with you. And um, about the Thanksgiving thing. Uh, what I got from my meat for the night was that Thanksgiving means give and be thankful and thank you for giving. Uh, it's like uh, it ain't about uh, this here high velocity, uh, high pollutant, whatever, you know, that's out there like what you're showing on the screen. Uh, and I really do appreciate you bringing up this here, you know, uh, video thing about uh, you know, bring 100% of it, get tied in. You know, it's money, 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 money. That's all it's about. You right. know, and it, you know, in, in, in the love of money is the root of all evil is what the Bible says. It's what I've read from it. And it's 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 insane. But if you'll be thankful about the little things like that mint, uh, you know, the knives and the coming or whatever, however you say it, I mean, it don't matter what you have. If you just give it to somebody that needs it, out of the goodness of your heart, and you be thankful for giving it, and they'll be thankful for receiving it. I guess. Ho- if that hopefully, makes any sense. hopefully, hopefully. But but the point the point I was making in all this was, the, in the first the first Thanksgiving was result. They were able to give things because they did what God said, and and you know people will not be able to truly realize how much God can bless them. In uh, in giving in the, the church in their giving because they're not doing what God said in the rest of the things. I mean they're they're having all these big building projects and they're having all these different ministries that cater and and try to to try to get people in, but they're not giving them the word, which is what they really need to do. Exactly. And so since you're not doing what God said on this area, you're never going to see the blessings that will really cause you to be thankful because you're disobeying God. So. Uh, I appreciate your call. I'm out of time. Okay, listen. Do you do you do the do you go preaching down on the 250 Boulevard all the time? Yes. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Have a good night. All right. All right, friends. We're out of time, but I do want to say uh, before we go, you know, again, the reason to be thankful is because uh, what God has given us, and one of the greatest things, or the greatest thing you can you can uh, be thankful for, is the fact that God has sent His only begotten Son. To die for our sins, if we will be obedient to Him, uh, those sins will be forgiven. Hebrews five verse nine, the Bible says that uh, He is the author of salvation to all that will obey Him. If you will obey Him by being by believing that He's the Son of God, repenting of your sins, Acts uh, seventeen thirty, confessing Christ before man, Romans ten nine and ten, and being baptized for the remission of sins. You'll be a member of the body of Christ. Your sins will be gone. God will put you into the church, the the saved body, and you can truly have a reason to give thanks. Till next time, friends, thanks for watching. Always remember, ask, what does the Bible say? And you'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. I couldn't stay in Johnny at first. I thought he was a nut. And once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me angry. Talking about the Lauren Hardy show on Wednesday. Don't worry about them, some of y'all. Get off of it, would you? Don't dare do that again. Shut that up. Shut that up.
As your pastor, I am telling you, please, don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Lawl and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance, and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always 